Begin again. Begin again. What do you feel when I say those words? Is it a sense of anticipation or is it a sense of fear or irritation or anger? You might wonder why so many of our services this particular January have been focused on beginning again. How do you feel if I say it a different way? Start over. Is that better or worse? <laughs> Same feelings, different emotions. The reality is that every day we start again, we begin again, and perhaps it's reassuring as we do so that we have these routines that we use and that helps us not feel so overwhelmed every time. And we're still recovering from a time when all of those routines seem to have disappeared. Yesterday I had to think about that. I got up before a lot of meetings that I had on my plate for yesterday, and at 8 a.m. I was at the Y ready to swim because I had missed a week. I had swum throughout the winter during most of the torrential rains, but just not that week before last. Yesterday, when I got up, my car was covered with a heavy frost. And it felt a little daunting to be there in my swim robe and swimsuit. Even though I had swum other days with frost, getting into the car and realizing that I do not own a scraper, which I owned when I lived on other parts of the world, I had to turn the car around in the cul-de-sac to face the sun for a few minutes so that it could melt my windshield. And in that time, I invited myself to look anew, to see the beauty of the crystals on the windshield, even as I was shivering a bit in the cold. There is something about starting again that makes everything just a little bit more fragile, a little bit more precious, a little bit more beautiful, and a little bit more maddening. That's the world we're living in. And this world, the world that greets us every day now, requires us to start over in so many ways because some of us in these last years have lost strength in various ways, spiritual, emotional, physical. Some of us now deal with levels of fear we never had had before. Many of us, many of us, so many of us are grieving because we lost loved ones who are part of the structure of our world. Because many of us lost parts of our own health in a time when healthcare was harder to come by. And the world, social, economic, and environmental, just keeps changing and swirling. And even the ways we gather together have changed. We could all approach this, and we want to approach this, with the expertise we had from other times. Or we could approach it with what Buddhist teacher and author Shunru Suzuki calls beginner's mind. Of this, the Suzuki Roshi writes, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. Thich Nhat Hanh, the venerated founder of the Order of Inner Being who died a year ago today, said the past is gone, the future is not yet here, and if we do not go back to ourselves in the present moment, we cannot be in touch with life. Here we are. Between the departed past and the unknown future, and we're all in odd states of fear and choice. In the workplace, one manifestation of this is now known very commonly as quiet quitting. It's a term which is actually not just about the people who take advantage of working at home to skate on the edges of their responsibilities. The term actually speaks to those who decided very intentionally that they don't want to resume the level of work focus they had before, so they're no longer competing or trying to get ahead, or in some cases, even working their full responsibilities, having been reminded that work is not as precious as the other things to them. Short term, as Sharon Sabota said, we make choices in long term, though these could be dilemmas. I understand about these boundaries we are learning to set. I too made many decisions during these last couple years. I'm gonna share just a few. One is to protect Monday, which is my day off, 
from my own life and volunteer work as many days as I can a year. The other is, another smaller one, is not to wear shoes that hurt. <laughs> Since on an average day, especially if I'm here, I walk more than 8,000 steps every time I come on this campus. So sorry for those of you who tell me every now and then you wish I would wear more cute footwear. <laughs> and people do tell me this. And then I also made the choice to keep up with my physical health, hence the swimming on the frigid morning. There is, however, another kind of quiet quitting that exists around our larger commitments to one another. And I think in 2023 it's time to say that out loud. The sense of despair that the issues we face are too large to address, that sense of powerlessness that we experienced so viscerally in 2020 and 2021 have made many turn away from community engagement. Just like with quiet quitting at work, opportunities exist to do away with the unnecessary activities which were more habit than productive. And yet, it goes beyond this. With an intensified sense of our own vulnerability and the world's complexity, which we all got to study when we didn't have as much to distract us, we are not so sure that the small things that we can do are worth the time to do them, whether it's just helping a friend or helping a community or doing something larger. One of the things we grieve is our ideals, which have been battered in recent years. And one of the places where we're struggling to begin again to find that beginner's mind is the area of our common commitments to one another, the ways we work together to create good together. If the last three years have taught us anything, they've shown us that we have a lot of reasons why we need to resume these commitments. Just this week, I learned that our county, Contra Costa County, has the highest rate of eviction in the entire state of California, which is one of the reasons we had to worry so much about our neighbors in this month of extreme weather. And we may feel less hope that we can do anything productive because the things that we know in our expert mind, those things that were our knowledge, our trade, they don't seem to be working anymore. We know we don't know the answers. And that's not how we'd like to go into action. So here we are, beginner's mind again. In about two weeks, I will be in my home congregation pulpit in Durham, North Carolina, where I was first introduced to the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh in the 1980s. This venerable teacher who loved to do a walking meditation holding the hand of a child, who introduced mindfulness to the world, died, as I said, a year ago today. And his form of Buddhism particularly spoke to me as a young person because he believed that one could nurture the spirit and and engage in the world, that it wasn't a choice. And it was very relevant because we've all been through those times when we are struggling to figure out, again, what our relationship is with the larger world. In his practices and his teachings, he offers many paths to hold both together. Let's listen to some of his words, his poem, Call Me By My True Names. Even today, I am still arriving. Look deeply. Every second, I am arriving to be a bud on a spring branch, to be a tiny bird with still fragile wings, learning to sing in my new nest, to be a caterpillar in the heart of a flower, to be a jewel hiding itself in a stone. I still arrive in order to laugh and to cry to fear and to hope. The rhythm of my heart is the birth and death of all that is alive. I am a mayfly metamorphosing on the surface of the river. I am the bird that swoops down to swallow the mayfly. I am a frog swimming happily in the clear water of a pond. And I am the grass snake that silently feeds itself on the frog. I am the child in Uganda, all skin and bones, my legs as thin as bamboo sticks. And I am the arms merchant, 
selling deadly weapons to Uganda. I am the 12-year-old girl, refugee on a small boat, who throws herself into the ocean after being raped by a sea pirate. And I am also the pirate, my heart not yet capable of seeing and loving. I am a member of the Politburo with plenty of power in my hands. And I am the man who has to pay his debt of blood to my people, dying slowly in a forced labor camp. My joy is like spring, so warm. It makes flowers bloom all over the earth. My pain is like a river of tears, so vast it fills the four oceans. Please call me by my true names so I can hear all my cries and laughter at once, so I can see that my joy and pain are one. Please call me by my true names so I can wake up and the door of my heart could be left open, the door of compassion. And so we are in our times. We are a beloved sunny day and the deer and the turkeys on the hillside. We are also the sliding hillsides and the flooded streams. We are the Russians advancing and the Ukrainians defending. We are the people who survived the atmospheric rivers without a roof over their heads and their landlords who in this county evict more people than almost anywhere else in the United States. We are the migrants taking that often lethal journey and we are the people who are willing to welcome them home. Mindfulness, including care for our own true needs, is part of what we need. Though it may seem counterintuitive if we go with our old mind knowledge, meditation is not evasion, it is a serene encounter with reality, Thich Nhat Hanh says. He wrote this in his classic Miracle of Mindfulness, which was actually not a self-help treatise that was written for the privileged. It was actually written for young social workers in war-torn Vietnam in the 1960s who were dealing with horror and atrocities all around. It's different from the ways we have to distract ourselves, mindfulness is. It's not like binge watching or shopping, which is what sometimes we have come to think in this time when marketing has played a bigger and bigger role in our life as self-care. When we stop feeding our cravings, we will discover we have everything we need to be happy, Thich Nhat Hanh says. Sherry Maples was a student of this teacher who came to a retreat he led in the US looking for something and also doubting that anything was there to be found for her and her people. She was a police officer. She was exhausted. She was burnt out. And she was really doubtful that mindfulness would help, but she needed something. When she found it did help, she convinced Thich Nhat Hanh to hold a retreat just for police officers, and she convinced them to come, even though they were even more skeptical than she had been. She was then convinced that you could be a bodhisattva and still carry a gun, that you could be, in fact, a fierce bodhisattva. So much of Dharma practice is about recognizing what actually is and then seeing it more clearly. The man known as Tai, or teacher, wrote, it is about seeing what we have not seen before and opening up the aperture so we're not missing the different aspects of our reality. This is a kind of true care for oneself and for a community that can be a way to approach a new way of being in the world, that beginner's mind. For it exists outside of the false dichotomy that says we can either be spiritual or we can be engaged. That we can either care for ourselves or we can care for others. When you have compassion in your heart, you suffer less, Thich Nhat Hanh said. Compassion is only possible when you have understanding. Understanding brings compassion. When you understand the sufferings of other people, you cannot hate them anymore. I consider the miracle of mindfulness to have been part of the salvation of my own life. When I started at that church in Durham, I had days when I wondered whether life was worth living. And I had days when I acted in ways that intentionally endangered my existence. The affirmation that I got from my community, the sense of purpose, 
the opportunities to see, speak my truth and chances to grow and learn and lead, allowed me to emerge from that time and survive and thrive and pledge my life to creating those opportunities for others. In these worrying times when so many are making their only choice, the me and not including the we, I return to the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh, this small, quiet genius who said that we can have both nourishment of our own selves and still get what we truly need, that sense of vitality, connection, and livelihood, that sense of well-being, freedom, and purpose, which gives us true joy. We can care about ourselves and our connections and interbeing. Such a new concept requires for many of us beginner's mind. I invite us at this point in 2023, here in this sanctuary, whether physically or virtually, to ask ourselves not just what did we miss in those fearful months of shelter, what did we learn about what we truly needed? What did we learn about how much we were needed? Living alone, I was much comforted by the sound of voices in the evenings, and I became a voracious consumer of podcasts. Yet I do not want today, in January 2023, to prioritize my life around podcasts as much as I enjoy them. I don't even want to do it around cooking every day, which I loved and which totally does not work with my 2023 life. We're in a time of remaking, reimagining, reconstructing, while we're also grieving, trying to get our bearings, trying to figure out what paradigms still work. That's what I'll be doing on a bigger scale when I take next month for some sabbatical time, which I'm grateful to do so because of this amazing hardworking leadership that we have here, both staff and our board leadership. I look forward to returning to you with a little bit more understanding from my perspective of our true possibilities amid the reality of this world, the one we inhabit now. Today, as I said, is the one year anniversary of Thich Nhat Hanh's death. And in honor of that yesterday, Plum Village, the community he built in France because he was exiled from Vietnam for most of his adult life, because of his anti-war activism, released a new documentary on his death, which shows that even after he suffered a stroke in 2014 and completely lost the ability to speak, he continued to lead and to prepare people for his eventual loss on this earth. He did so by allowing them to embrace the reality of his life after the stroke. He brought his paralyzed face into contact with the children, even though it sometimes startled them. He still played with them. And though he could not speak, his students venerated and revered the teachings he offered through a slight gesture or through a signal that they understood because he had been teaching them for so long. At an all night sitting meditation following his cremation, those who were his most direct students sat in a night long silence the silence which his students called his last Dharma talk. In this way, he demonstrated how to live in what he once called a serene encounter with reality, not denying it, and yet still finding what within it could be savored. A serene encounter with reality is what our reorienting souls and our recuperating world demands of us. There are times the spirit will say do, and there are times when the spirit will say don't. And it's good that we know both. It is good that we still want to change the world. And it's good that we still want to be changed by the world. In these liminal times, let us take up the time-honored approach of beginner's mind again in hopes that we too will be vehicles for that serene encounter in this world, which we must love, for it is the world we have.